Alles. Um, thank you, uh, Schuss, uh, Marco, and Marin. Actually, uh, Marin, I, um, you've got the right setting uh, for the talk here, I can see. Um, uh, I'm going to show you my desk later. Let me just share my screen. Um, share with computer sound. So you should be able to see something, right, Carlos? Okay, great. Um, welcome everybody to the last day of this conference uh, for getting up so early or for staying up so late, wherever you are. Um, so you can watch the talk. Um, I, I'm sad to inform you that um, Marco has uh, told us that it's going to be recorded on YouTube. So you can go right back to sleep. Um, now, if you're here anyway, um, I'm going to talk about how the music comes out of the piano, and you're going to notice in a while how um, that quote is wrong. Um, and it's about learning with computers and from computers, as opposed to learning about computers, which is um, what often is the theme. And there is some tension there, and I'm going to share a few thoughts about this. Um, as uh, Carlos has pointed out, I'm a researcher at SAP, um, where I work on, on SNAP. Uh, that's an interactive visual programming language in the web browser. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, it looks like Scratch, um, but it takes the semantics from Scheme. Um, it's been translated in a bunch of languages. I think it's 44, so kids can use it in their native um, uh, kind of languages. From Scheme, it's got things like, uh, this is kind of how we express Lambda. Um, uh, it's used for UC Berkeley's introductory course for non-computer science majors. And that course is called The Beauty and Joy of Computing. And, you know, I can't point out often enough how I believe that every course at every university should be called the beauty and joy of this subject. Um, it's also a kind of a national nationwide curriculum. We're abbreviating it BJC in the US. There's some advanced placement computer science principles course that's endorsed by the college board. Um, and we've got users all around the world. And it's not just my project. Um, Kind of my co-author and co-designer is Brian Harvey of UC Berkeley, but also other researchers at UC Berkeley, uh, like Dan Garcia, Michael Ball, Lauren Mock, and my friends and colleagues at SAP working on the same project, uh, Jatka Hügle, um, Bernard uh, Romagosa. And, you know, the good thing about this is that now with the internet, we can collaborate with people all over the world. So there are also um, people in, in, in Barcelona, um, like um, Joan Guilen, um, uh, working in the same team, and it's free and open software. Um, so last year, we were preparing our first SNAP conference in Germany at the very Heidelberg University of Education that we were supposed to be in here now, had it not been for all these monsters and, and natural disasters preventing us to be there. And we've been meeting up with teachers in Germany and schools, and we wanted to invite them and say, you know, hey, here's this conference. Why don't you come to us? And uh, my colleague, Yadga, went off to kind of Google these schools and see, you know, whether we could find whether they have a computer science department. And after a while, she came back and said, Jens, you got to look at this. There's something funny here. Um, so this kind of part of the um, schools that we Googled and we looked at their um, computer science um, page. So let's just, let's just look at some of these pages. Uh, so this is the German gymnasium, Merania gymnasium. So informatic, that's the German word for computer science. They show a bunch of computers and then there's not much there except this quote. Uh, and that's basically the version that computer science is as much about computers as astronomy is about telescopes from Esger Dijkstra. Uh, wow, so that's a statement. Okay, um, we were also looking at other schools. Um, so that's the Franz Mittenberg Gymnasium in Germany. 
So what do they have to say about computing and computer science? Uh, you guessed it. Oh, it's not about computers because Ed's got Dijkstra says so. Um, uh, I mean, you can kind of guess where this is going to. Like every school we looked at um, in Germany kind of has it like hits right at the top. It's the big, the, the first thing, the only thing you need to know about informatics, about computer science is, you know, screw computers. Um, uh, because Edsker Dijkstra says so. Um, and, you know, Dijkstra, I read about, kind of was a Turing Award laureate. So that's kind of the Nobel Prize of computing. Boy, that's some authoritative, unambiguous thing. Uh, well, you know, any, 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 anyone here? Here's another one, right, right at the top. Um, I'm not going to go through all the list. Um, but we also looked at some, you know, um, universities. So here's uh, the University of Erlangen um, about computer science, and you know, sure enough, um, here it is. It's the telescope quote of Dijkstra, um, apparently. Um, so. Um, yeah, here's here's uh, University of Halle. You can see a pattern here. And by the way, we've we, we've tried this in other languages. It seems to be a German specific thing. Um, now that quote is popular all over, but there's got to be some law in Germany, or maybe it's some European directive, the Dijkstra directive. You got to have this quote on top of your page. Um, oh, look, look at this. This is the. Uh, German Armed Forces University in Munich, and, and that's kind of even funny, of course. So, so they, they're not really teaching computer science. This is informatics. It's, it's for system admins. And this is, so what does a, um, an applied informaticist do? Well, guess what? It's not about computers, um, because Dijkstra says so. Um, um, and I could go on with this. So kind of the takeaway of this is, yeah, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. Um, so let me just kind of visualize the idea. So if you're an astronomer, and you're using a telescope, uh, you're really doing it wrong. What you would, ought to do instead is um, kind of, you know, study books and study what others have written to um, get some knowledge um, and to advance science. Um, and so here's another kind of um, way that this is discussed, like this adversity almost against computers, um, that we shouldn't use computers in school. This is um, a paper by Humbert and, and others. Um, and there's more people, uh, more, more papers like this. And it's, it's, it's having this quote, because the music is not inside the piano. Uh, now you kind of get where my, talk title is coming from. It shows a picture of Alan Kay and it poses the question, um, should there be computing education without computers? And then it goes on for a couple of pages and discusses things and, and then we kind of conclude, yes, computer science without computers is desirable. And then of course they don't say computer science, they say informatics, which is something different in Germany than it is in the US. They don't say computers because they say information. No, they say informatic systems. I don't know where they got that word from, uh, but they mean computers. Um, and they also say, you know, after conceptual understanding has been accomplished, then you might consider computers to implement something, but, you know, only after um, you've laid the foundation with actual um, pencils and pen. Um, so, um, now, it seems as if, if you want to learn with computers, kind of computers are really a bad idea. In fact, if you want to learn anything, um, computers are a bad idea. Um, they're almost an obstacle to, to, to get to the pure knowledge, to the pure foundation of anything. Instead, what we should focus on is really get the foundations right. First, get the basics. First, understand all the concepts and maybe have some didactics that help us uh, digest it very slowly. Um, and then, you know, afterwards we can, we might program more, maybe never because it's not about computers. And 
even computer science is so much more than programming, right? Um, so we need to take care of all these other things. Um, so let me just visualize this. This is kind of a picture that um, Alan Kay, who was mentioned in this paper, drew in the early 70s. It was Alan's vision um, for kind of how kids would you know, interact in the future with each other, not so much with computers. So you see these two kids having iPads that aren't really iPads because they also have keyboards. Um, what you can't see is that these um, devices are connected with each other through a network that wasn't invented back then. They're actually playing a game collaboratively. And Alan's vision was that they write um, interactive essays where they kind of share their ideas in an explorative way so their peers can play with the ideas. So the whole idea was that the computer would sort of melt to the back, or almost disappear. So it is a medium to explore other ideas. And now what this current discussion is making us believe is that Alan didn't mean that. Alan actually meant, um, you know, you shouldn't use computers. And instead, um, what you should do is do computer science without computers. So this is kind of the flagship activity of a website called Computing, uh, Computer Science Unplugged. It's, it's four kids holding cards, one, two, four, eight. You get it, they're playing digits in a binary um, number system. Um, and that's kind of a foundation of informatics because after all computers work with binary numbers and we got to master binary numbers before we can, um, work with computers and something strikes me as odd here. On the left hand side, we have this vision where computers can be a medium to explore things that have nothing to do with computers, where we can share media, where we can find out powerful ideas. And that was the vision. And what we're proposing now is, oh wait, computers are so important, we have to know binary numbers uh, without computers. So in a way, it's almost ironic that having no computer makes the computer even more apparent and more at the center of the activity. And I was wondering whether that is something that Alan actually meant. Um, now, I've had the incredible privilege and, and luck to have Alan as my boss for a couple of years. And I do remember him saying the music is not in the piano often. It's something that Alan just keeps um, saying whenever um, he talks about education. Um, but did he really mean it in that way? So this is Alan um, kind of in our lab, the picture I made, Alan looking into the future <laughs> in a kind of 3D goggle. Um, so we had a, a lab in, in LA. Um, and this is what it looked like. Um, so this is a picture I took in our lab. And so, yeah, there is a computer there. There's also tons of ukuleles. Um, so it seems strange to me to associate Alan with, let's have music without a piano. Um, it's clearly not how I remember Alan. Um, so this is at Alan Kay's home. This is where he lives. In, Beverly Hills. And this is not a church, it's Alan's library. Alan loves reading books. He's got thousands and thousands of books. But there's something else kind of really very dominant. Um, it's an organ, it's an actual church organ. So Alan literally built his whole house, his life around an actual instrument. Uh, clearly he didn't say we should have music without instruments. Uh, that's That's so not like him. Um, and, and, you know, he likes uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, so we got a Captain Nemo um, playing the organ. Um, so I read up on the quote that is mentioned in the paper, and it's actually hard to find it, so I had to use the, the way back machine, um, kind of whether we're saying that we shouldn't use computers. And, and in that same interview, I kind of, Alan says, you know, that's the glory of it. In a book, you can print a score and that's good. But on a computer, 
uh, not only you can print the score, but you can start moving things around, experimenting with whole sets of musical languages. Notice how it's not about the computer, but he's clearly talking about using a computer to explore music. Um, and then he also mentioned Seymour Papert. And he mentions that Seymour Papert used to talk about this kid who was difficulty in math. And the whole idea is that he goes on about that, you know, there's something wrong with how we're teaching math because it only appeals to certain people, but not to others. But here the computer can be a rich environment, a context in which kids can learn. Um, he's also kind of said this quote more recently um, in another interview um, where he says, you know, the education establishment in the US has generally treated the computer A first as undesirable and shunned, which is pretty much the discussion we're having right now, or it's just sort of a typewriter, a tool. Um, and again, says that, you know, pioneers to Seymour Papert have explained pretty specifically just how computers can revolutionize education. And he's used the analogy of what would happen if you put a piano in every classroom. If there is no other context, you will get a chopsticks culture. Chopsticks, that's the da -da -dum -dum -dum, when you just play the, the black keys on the piano. And maybe even a pop culture. And this is pretty much what's happening. In other words, the music is not in the piano. I didn't see any mention of let's do computer science without computing. And in fact, let me, let me just um, kind of um, clearly state this. What I read in this interview is, you know, there ought to be more context for us to explore with computers so we can learn things. And that's something else is, is saying, oh, we shouldn't learn with computers because we should learn about computers. Um, so something that keeps coming up and that Alan always mentioned is how Seymour Papert, Cynthia Solomon, this whole work on logo was really inspirational, was really the reason for inventing personal computing back then. And the, the kind of core idea, one of the core ideas um, was that of hard fun. That is when you learn something that is hard fun. And this is a term that really is very ambiguous. The Americans kind of have a tendency to come up with ambiguous terms that can mean anything as we've seen. And for me, it has helped to envision hard fun really as kind of two dimensions of um, you know, an area um, where we can kind of talk about uh, the learning experiences that um, we want to provide to learners. So if something um, is easy, and that's often, you know, often the thing is, oh, this is easy. If it's easy and no fun, you know, it's just lame. Um, and um, you can't help being lame at times. And then common reflexes, well, you know, just wait uh, when we're done. Um, we, can, we can make this hard very soon, but then we're just cruel if we're hard and there's no fun. And, you know, for example, learning binary numbers before you do anything, it's just cruel. You know, all these exercises, uh, oh, bet you want to know what the next prime number is. We have a tendency to make things cruel to legitimize them as something that is worth by learning because we can test it and um, we can harass kids with it. Now, so a reflex is just to, to make things very motivational and make them very fun. And that's what Alan means when he says pop culture. So, and that's not necessarily bad. I mean, everybody loves music. Everybody loves interesting motivational things. So think about you know, all, the, all the hardware intensive stuff. Think about all the robotics um, courses we do where we let kids assemble bots and then program them to follow a line. Um, 
and we can make it hard, by the way, by letting them program in C++ later, but it's, uh, think about all these circuit boards, you know, Arduinos, micro bits, Calliope's that we're handing out to kids for, you know, fun activities. That's, a lot of that is pop culture. A lot of, you know, discussing um, with students ethical dilemmas, kind of now, um, kind of the, the, the trolley problem, like should the self-driving car hit the old little lady or you know, the group of kindergarten kids. That is pop culture. There's nothing special to be found there. And then of course, what we really want is we want something that is hard, fun. And that is something that um, in the words of, you know, Alan Kay and Seymour Papert is what they call a powerful idea. Now, powerful idea. There aren't that many really. Powerful ideas are ideas that change your life. Powerful ideas are ideas that make you give up your job as a lawyer and pursue computing instead. Um, powerful ideas are something that makes you leave your home, become a refugee to travel thousands of miles because human rights is something that is a powerful idea and you wanna have a part in that. Uh, powerful ideas are the things that are earth shaking. And I think, I guess every subject has powerful ideas. Like there's harmony in music. Um, uh, there's, you know, um, ecosystems. Um, and those we want to share. And all too often we have this tendency to start in the pop culture and just take it right to the cruelty. And that's the kind of the example, you know, we program something, a, a circuit board, that's kind of neat. We do it live and then we embed it and we say, now we got to build it into this car and parts making. And, you know, no wonder do we have such bad retention rates in the STEM studies. Um, so what it really is about is to me to use computers to find ways how we can actually use the computer not to study programming so much, but to discover other interesting ideas. And so, um, you know, had it coming, the obvious question is, look, can there be music in the computer? And um, I'm going to try something. First, let's close all these Dijkstra quotes. Um, so uh, this is the programming language I uh, know about. This is Snap. and um, so there's a kind of blocks, so there's a sensing category, there's a microphone block. I can click on this and I get the number, that's the volume of uh, how I'm speaking to you right now. I can also inspect other things. I can inspect the samples of the microphone. It's a bunch of numbers, kind of seemingly random. Um, and that's kind of interesting. So what I'm transmitting here, what you're hearing from me is essentially numbers. Um, and that's already some kind of big idea. You know, we're talking about digitalization in the true meaning of the word. You know, it's numbers, we're not talking about digital innovations. Sorry, Marco, sorry, because it's, it's actual, you know, digitalization. Um, so, you know, I guess we can look at these random numbers and they're, they're, they're kind of, they look like they're in between minus one and plus one. So we have the function in Scratch and in Snap that gives us a random number. If I click on it, I get a random number every time I click on it. Um, so I can kind of maybe simulate what I'm sending over the microphone by getting a random number in between minus one and one. So I click on that, I get minus one, zero, one, uh, but I don't get the numbers in between. Um, so I can do that by um, just getting a, a, a fraction. Now I'm getting more numbers. Um, and this is something we can do as an unplugged activity, by the way, we can use dice to come up with random numbers. Now we can write a little algorithm. Um, I'm gonna make a variable, just gonna say random numbers. Um, I'm gonna set the random numbers to a new list. Um, I'm going to use a repeat block to add a random number 
two random numbers. Okay, um, so now I'm doing this, and I've got 10 random numbers. Um, wow, um, not a big deal. So I can also do this like a um, hundred thousand times. And now if I do this, it really takes a long time because there's a visual program language, you wanna see the progress. So one thing that computers are really great at is making boring things, repetitive things really fast. So in Snap, we have this warp block, get it? It's, it's enterprise. So warp just basically does a kind of compute all you can in, in, in this one frame. So here's 100,000 random numbers in between you know, minus one and, 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 and one. And I've got this list of random numbers. And it kind of looks like the list that's coming out of my microphone. So I wonder what happens if I, you know, just play this back as a sound. Um, so um, I, I hope it's not gonna be too loud for you. Uh, just be warned. So I'm just gonna play back um, 100,000 random numbers. See, it's, it's, it's noise, it's like static noise, it's white noise. And what's happening is here, we have these numbers playing back means that um, there is um, at the rate of 44,100 numbers per second, um, a um, membrane is being either sucked or, or, or pulled away um, by a magnet depending on the size of that number. Um, and so what's happening is that membrane makes the ear move um, and then um, you get the sound. Um, so it's not quite what I'm sending to you. So let's make this a little shorter, um, uh, just 10,000. Um, so this is shorter. Let's actually make this uh, just 100. So now I've got a little sound of, a hundred random numbers is just a just 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 a little click, right? Um, so what happens if I'm just repeating these same random numbers over and over? So in order to do this, I would make a, a big list. And I can say I just copy this and say the big list is also going to be a number. Uh, it's also going to be a list, and I'm going to repeat um, this also kind of. Often, I'm going to say repeat this 300 times, and I'm just going to say you know, four i equals one to the length of my random numbers. Um, I'm going to add um, the item i of the random numbers to the big list. Um, well, let's try this. Um, so now I have two lists, uh, one small one with random numbers and a big list also with random numbers, but it's just repeating kind of the, the little bit of noise. So if I play the sound of the random numbers, I'm still getting this click. But what happens if I now play the big list? And this is interesting. Um, I don't know, probably you all know what's going to happen, um, but listen to this. Did you expect that? We get this overtone, rich, complex sound that sounds like um, some cheesy instrument. Um, so what we're happening here is that we're using a lot of numbers, a long list. And out of these random things, something almost beautiful emerges. Um, and look at this. So now we're repeating this a hundred times. What happens if we make the initial list longer? Um, again, doing this, playing this. Now the sound that's coming out seems to be at a different pitch. And you can try this with making it less long. Now we get a higher note. You can already see kind of where this is going. Um, there might be music 
in my computer just made purely out of numbers. So um, let me introduce you to um, Kevin Karplus. Anybody know Kevin Karplus? He's a um, um, computer science professor. And um, this is when he was still young. Um, Stanford um, in the 90s, um, Kevin and his friend Alexander Strong um, were playing around with these numbers and came up um, with an idea how to um, kind of just slightly modify this to make it even more interesting. Here's what Kevin and Alex came up with. So what if we just made another number that's called average? And what if we just, instead of just adding it right away, we say, here's an average. Average is gonna be something that we're gonna divide by two. And it's the sum of whatever the item I'm looking at with whatever the average was before. And we're adding the average to the big list. And here comes the kicker. Now we're doing something interesting. We're replacing the current item of the random numbers with the average. So the next time we come at this, we look at what we last computed at that very position. And, you know, let's try this and see what happens. Now we get something that doesn't sound so cheesy after all. We get something that sounds like a guitar. And this is interesting because what is really happening here is um, an idea that is called feedback. We're routing one of the results of a computation to be the input of the next iteration. And with this algorithm, um, out of the initial chaos, we have a self-organizing system so when we're plugging the string of a guitar, what is really happening is something very complex and we can have this beautiful, simple algorithm to represent it for us. Um, so um, Kevin called this algorithm the digitar algorithm for digital um, guitar. And to make music with it, we obviously need to kind of give it a note. So I'm going to turn this into a new block. This is one of the ideas of, of Snap, that we can make our own blocks and we can make our own function blocks. So I want to have a digitar node. Um, and so I'm making a new block. I'm just taking what I wrote, put it in here. So instead of playing the sound, um, I'm going to report the big list and um, I'm going to make some more variables um, so that they're local. Um, so the random numbers, I want them to be in here. Also the big list um, should be in here. Um, and we need one more variable because whenever we change the length of this, this affects the pitch. So we need to figure out the length of this initial random numbers list to control the node here. Um, so now I can actually kind of delete my variables here. Um, and um, I wanna make note an input. Um, so now I have this new block. And I want to give it a number as input so I can play a note. And so the idea is that, you know, in music, um, an octave has um, 12 half steps of a note. And we've already noticed that um, when we play with the length of this, I'm going to make a variable length, we're going to set this to something. Um, it affects the pitch. 
So we want to put the length in here. Um, we also want to put the length in here. Um, and we want to make sure that all these um, sounds are equally long. So we're just going to say, you know, at 44,000, we're just going to say 50,000 divided by the length. Um, so now we just need to determine the length. And um, so if you kind of look at my ukulele here, I got one um, sitting on my table. Um, when, you, when you see these um, strings and these frets, you notice that the distance between them isn't always the same. Um, so um, they start being larger and then they start becoming smaller or the other way if we start kind of with a with a short string in order to make it to make the the pitch deeper we need to expand it and now in in, in modern harmonics and even in pop culture we have complex chords so we just don't want to have the natural kind of tuning we want to have this exact kind of 12 tone tuning and that was um invented actually in the late uh, 16th century in China um, by a prince called uh, Zhu Sayu, who uh, very accurate, accurately uh, computed uh, kind of the exact distance between these um, uh, strings. And, 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 and there's a funny story to that um, as Zhu Sayu was experimenting um, this with actual instruments. He was doing so on his bamboo flutes and also on string instruments. And it's really a, a, a massive groundbreaking work and it wasn't recognized at the time. You know why? Um, because um, traditional Chinese scientists didn't like there to be um, observations made in reality. Instead, you were expected to study books and to get your knowledge out of books. Um, so we're gonna do um, equal temperament, as it's called. We're gonna take some bass length, the hundred, and this is an idea that actually Dutchman Stevine later formulated as um, a root of twelve. So it really is. Um, so we're gonna say two um, by yeah, the note divided by 12, that's the length. So now let's see whether we can get a sound out of this. And we get a sound. So now um, if I put in a lesser number, I should get a shorter string so the tone should be higher. And it is that way. So now what I can do with this let me try this. I can make an instrument. An instrument is just a variable. And I can set the instrument. And I'm going to map my digitar block over a descending list of numbers. So I can get a list of numbers from 1 to 10. Now how about I want to get the numbers from 16 to 0, so I have a little more than an octave. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of pre-compute um, some of these tones so I don't have to compute them um, again whenever I want to play a note. Um, now modern computers are fast enough to do that, but SNAP is an a educational language, so we actually want to show what's going on. Um, so it takes a little longer to compute this. Um, so now I have an instrument and I can try some things. Like I can say for each note in my instrument, um, play the sound, each note really just is a sound, and wait a little bit. Um, I'm just waiting a little bit, that's going to point one six. Let's try this. Wow, this kind of already sounds like an instrument. Uh, let's see whether we can make some music. Um, so, um, uh, wait, where is, um, um, there's a little song, um, that I've, should be coming up. Here's a song. A song is really just a, 
a list of numbers that tells us um, at which tonal step a note is. So I can just import the CSV into Snap and it's just a list, it's another list, it's, it's, it's just, you get kind of some numbers and I can play them back by saying, you know, for each note in the song. Now I wanna play the item that note resembles on my instrument. Um, let's try this. Let's see whether there is actually music in here. So this is the digital algorithm. And you know, look at this, this is all it takes to build a musical instrument, to build a full guitar with harmony from nothing, just from numbers. But it's not nothing. You've seen all these large numbers because what's happening here is out of these numbers, something happens when you have a lot of them. And that something is a phenomenon that we call emergence. And in order to experience an idea like emergence, a computer is incredibly helpful because it can do something that is actually quite boring a lot. Now, if you look at this algorithm, and I chose it because of this, it's not computationally interesting. Usually when I talk about Snap, I show something that is very expressive. This one doesn't even have a higher order function in it. It doesn't have lambda in it. Um, this is, it's, it's basically the stuff you can do with mere beginners. There's just, just a bunch of, of loops and, and variables and a little bit of math. Um, it's not about learning computing. It's not about learning computer science. It's about learning a phenomenon called emergence. It's about learning about feedback and feedback is used all over. Feedback happens in biology. Um, so this is about hearing a fractal, hearing patterns. Now that we have it, we can use abstractions with it. So we have a function that takes an input. This is abstraction. We've got a song that is just numbers. So we can, um, you know, map, another function over it to transpose the song. So this is a song, it starts, it starts with a one six. Now if we map the plus four function over it, it starts with five ten. And we've even made it in snap. So you don't need a map. If you just apply addition, the addition operator to a list of numbers, you can apply um, this addition to the whole vector of numbers. So now we can transpose this up. And then we can think about music. We can think about this sonata form. I bet the Eagles will love that. So this is the idea that we can learn from computers things that we otherwise cannot learn if we just do it um, with pencil and paper. Some ideas are really best experienced with computers. Think about image manipulation. Think about um, searching, making statistics of the most common words in the works of Shakespeare. But increasingly important ideas can only be seen on computers. Think about climate change models. Think about ecosystems. Think about economic models. Basically, everything that has happened since um, Thomas Schelling got the uh, Nobel um, Memory um, Award. But another reason to use computers in school is that access to computers is something that is important and that is actually um, an issue of equity because 
if you're not using computers at school, if you're not letting kids use computers at school, only rich kids in private schools are going to use computers. And the reason I love best is, as Seymour Papert said, computers can be math land. It can be for learners of mathematics, what France is for learners of French. It can be an environment in which we can express ourselves. So I want to close just with some thoughts about kind of education and learning actually from computers. Let's make sure to share our best ideas. Let's not share the bad ones. We can share them later when we run out of good ideas. Let's make sure we don't run out of time so the best ideas come last. Let's not start with foundations because we might not even get to the good stuff. Second, computers can be a great medium for bringing powerful ideas to life. If you have a piano, be sure to set the context so your students will be able to make music on it. If you have a computer, please come up with some interesting ideas that you can do with them and let it not be binary numbers. And for the love of God, let's not be cruel to kids. Let's not do things just because they're hard and we can test them. Let's not justify our things just because of rigor. So what about this thing? I can tell you, as Carlos mentioned, I'm actually a lawyer. I looked it up. There is no German law. There is no European directive that forces schools to put the Dijkstra quote about no computers up first thing on the website. And there's certainly no law requiring us to say this is the most important and only thing you need to know about computing. And in preparation for this talk, I wanted to find out more about the context uh, where Dijkstra said that. And it's a little bit funny, I guess most of you already know it. Um, uh, I think it's even on Wikipedia now. Um, it all boils down to a bunch of people thinking about this and say, well, he never wrote it in, in any of his um, papers. And there is really no hard evidence that Dijkstra ever said that. Hal Abelson said it, uh, the beginning of the SIGP lecture videos, but uh, it boils down to that it's actually not a Dijkstra quote at all. Um, so, um, you know, um, next time you think about redesigning your web page, um, if you're a university, if you're a school, um, uh, just don't use an intellectually and academically embarrassing quote. So, um, yeah, let's also update our school's web pages. Um, and with that, I'm closing. And thank you very much for your patience with me while I'm trying to code something live here. Thank you very much.